It is the final day of the U.S. hosted APEC Economic Leaders Meeting in San Francisco. In a speech delivered at the leaders' retreat on Friday, Chinese President Xi Jinping called on APEC members to maintain innovation and openness. He emphasized the grouping must reject any attempt to politicize or impose security implications on economic and trade issues. And again, promoted the building of total of, of regional free trade area of the Asia Pacific. President Xi encouraging APEC members to commit to green development, and he highlighted the need to pursue inclusive development that benefits everyone. Well, for the very latest on the ground from San Francisco, we're going to turn it over to our good friend Mike Walter, who is live out there. Mike, walk us through what's been happening at this major economic leaders meeting. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Very, very busy time here. APEC finally wrapping up after a week of productive talks between the U.S. and China and the rest of the member economies, for that matter, as well. And as expected, the meetings between Chinese President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden have been fruitful and positive. It's a definite far cry from the last few years of diplomatic tensions, to say the least. And after hours of talks between the two spread out over the past couple of days, Xi and Biden had uh, two concrete pledges, really. Biden said China had agreed to reopen communication channels between the U.S. and Chinese militaries. The other agreement calls for creating a counter-narcotics working group to help crack down on illegal drugs. But the most important takeaway from their face-to-face -face meetings, rather, is the fact that both Xi and Biden struck a conciliatory tone. For more on all of the talks between Xi and Biden, I'm joined by my good friend Dan Williams, who's been tracking all of this, following it all. What were your takeaways uh, listening to President Xi over the last few days? Well, certainly, as you say, the, the summit between China President Xi Jinping and the U.S. President Joe Biden on Wednesday, that really has been the overarching uh, element this, uh, this week. Um, sitting down for those face-to-face -face talks, just the second time the two have had those face-to-face -face talks uh, since uh, Joe Biden uh, took office. Uh, and some four hours of talks with some real tangible uh, takeaways from that, as you say, not least the military-to-military -military communications being restored as well. Uh, but a key element as well as also being Xi Jinping meeting many of these other, uh, the business executives at the various lunches and uh, uh, evening uh, dinners and uh, other meetings that have been taking place here, the CEO summit as well, uh, getting a standing ovation as well from, uh, from time to time as well, uh, the likes of Tim Cook, uh, Apple CEO, being part of those discussions too. Uh, and uh, really, uh, if you want to kind of see another signal of perhaps uh, the uh, improvement of these uh, potential ties between the US and China uh, might have come with the, the China uh, potentially sending new pandas <laughs> to the US as well. That news coming out through this week as well. The panda is a big, big deal for the, right. for the rest of us who like to go to the zoos <laughs> with our kids. You've certainly got some young ones. It's so interesting because we've been in the Moscone Center for the last few days, but really the news coming in Woodside, which is about 40 kilometers away, these talks, but it's not the only thing we've seen. We've seen President Xi meeting on the sidelines with other uh, nations, Mexico. Yesterday afternoon, uh, President of Peru, Fiji, Japan, Brunei. Again, kind of uh, talking about strengthening economic and trade cooperation. Can you walk us through some of these other developments? Yeah, these bi bilateral uh, uh, talks that take place here at APEC, just, uh, just so important. And obviously, we've been focusing a lot on the, the U.S.-China uh, uh, summit, but there's just so been so many other ones, not least the one uh, between China and Mexico. Uh, Xi Jinping noticing that uh, in his discussions there that uh, bilateral trade with Mexico and China jumping some 7,000 times. Uh, since uh, diplomatic ties uh, were established some 51 years ago, uh, and urging both sides to work more closely. Uh, that was the, uh, the key element, not just on some of the traditional areas that you would expect, infrastructure, construction and the like, but also some of the emerging industries as well, finance, electric vehicles uh, and the like. But also uh, the other meeting that really stood out, uh, the one uh, with Peru, where um, obviously they're going to be the next hosts of APEC in 2024. Uh, and again, Xi Jinping talking about how uh, he's looking to support that hosting and also uh, looking to support the China uh, ties with Latin America countries as well. Those are the, the two that really stuck out for me. Yeah, very big week. Uh, thanks, Dan, for tracking all of this for us. And that's it from the APEP meetings here in San Francisco. We're going to send it back to you in the studio, Sean. Okay, Mike, thanks uh, so much. Well, artificial intelligence really emerged as a key topic of APEC as well. As Karina Mitchell uh, discovered, California could be ground zero when it comes to advancing that technology.
World leaders gathered in San Francisco for APEC this week have been discussing a range of issues, including the responsible use of artificial intelligence. Mitigating the potential risks of harnessing and advancing the technology was a key talking point between the presidents of China and the United States during their sideline meeting. We're going to get our experts together to discuss risk and safety issues associated with artificial intelligence. As many of you who travel with me around the world, almost everywhere I go, every major leader wants to talk about the impact of artificial intelligence. But it isn't just world leaders having conversations about the future impact of AI. CEOs, influencers and policymakers also held a panel spotlighting the issue, focusing on the responsible intersection of AI and environmental sustainability. How does it affect the world? Can we come up with new innovative ways to figure out how do we can sequester carbon? I think those are really important. So where the data is, is where AI is going to be the most effective. They would like to discuss how to utilize how to utilize AI to benefit the society, in particular, in this case, to benefit the problem, to benefit, to solve the problems on the climate changes. And AI has a huge, huge potential in terms of analyze the data. However, that potential doesn't come risk-free. Google CEO Sundar Pichai delivered a warning comparing AI to climate change. He said if AI goes wrong in one country, it could impact others. Matt Mahan is the mayor of the city of San Jose and a former tech entrepreneur. He says while California is well known as a tech hub, the future of AI is in his town. Hey, we're one of the most diverse cities in the world, highly, highly educated, more patents per capita than any other city in the United States. And it's that diverse mix of technical talent that makes us the city that goes fastest from idea to commercialization. But Mayhan believes while the future is bright when it comes to AI, sensible regulation is vital. I think the best thing government can do is lean into AI and define the use cases that we most want to support. The private sector will need to have some guardrails around it, but in the public sector, we should be defining the kind of problems we want to solve. Climate change, mobility issues, where we can use AI as a powerful new tool to help us prototype and experiment and solve problems. Panel members agree, saying the right balance of public and private sector support will result in a win-win for society. Karina Mitchell, CGTN, San Francisco. Okay, joining us now to delve into everything that has happened at APEC this week is Saurabh Gupta. He is a senior Asia-Pacific policy specialist at the Institute for China-America Studies. Saurabh, it's good to see you again. Thanks for uh, taking time on this Friday evening here in the U.S. Sure. I want to um, begin by just kind of taking a, a, a broad brush, if you will, the major takeaways. Coming in, there was a certain degree of anxiety. What, what would happen? How would President Xi and Biden respond? People would look at everything from their body language to the tone of the speeches. So what was your major takeaway? Uh, my major takeaway was that, uh, of course, the U.S.-China meeting that, that did take place with President Xi and President Biden was the overriding focus this year of APEC. It might have even taken away, uh, sucked away a little of the oxygen from APEC, but that, that was one of the most important important things that we will remember going, once APEC is in the rearview mirror, APEC in San Francisco. But a second key takeaway too, which is not too far away from what I just said, was how fitting it is to have APEC in San Francisco this year mm. at a time when there's so much innovation in the digital sector. And as we've heard in the area of artificial intelligence, it, this is really the, 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 the artificial intelligence capital of the world in some, in some respects, San Francisco and California. And so how fitting it is that the most innovative part of the world, I'm talking the Asia Pacific region, is all gathered in San Francisco talking about how do we go move forward and protect this innovation and secure it while also ensuring in President Xi and President Biden meeting that the two biggest political players in the Asia Pacific and on the planet can be on, 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 on fairly harmonious terms or on orderly terms with each other so that that, that process of, of growth, prosperity and innovation can steam ahead and that the two countries can work together rather than at cross purposes with each other. You know, it's interesting um, to pick up on one thing you said. It could have taken some of the oxygen out of APEC, but in many ways, 
it really had to be a success, the meeting between these two world economic leaders, for APEC uh, to be a success. And uh, talk about some of the significant outcomes that did come about. If you look at the op opioid crisis in the United States, the ability to uh, track the, uh, the, uh, the chemicals, if you will, that make fentanyl that come out of China, President Xi promising to crack down on that. But clearly, President Xi came into this meeting with things he wanted. And, and top on that list, of course, more investment in China uh, to add some more uh, growth to that economy and also chip away at all the technology back and forth that the United States and China have had. Yeah, exactly. You're correct on that front. You know, this is, it's called an APEC economic leaders meeting. It's not called the APEC political leaders meeting. And economics should not have divisions and boundaries. And the best best economics is interconnected win-win economics. And that's why President Xi was talking. Uh, he, he, was, he, he talked uh, in terms of protecting the multilateral order, which is, again, very fitting at APEC because APEC has always chosen to be complementary to international to international economics and the multilateral trade system and not as a substitute for it. We are beginning to see certain blocks like even IPEF, which want to substitute for it, yet APEC champions open regionalism. And here was President Xi hewing himself to, to the color, his colors, the mast of open regionalism, which is connected to the multilateral trading system. And I thought that was an important contribution. I thought his speeches also were well picked out the previous right, right. evening. He talked in terms of people-to-people -people ties between the U.S. and China, which is very important to take forward and stabilize the relationship. So I thought uh, this year's APEC, yes, you were correct in your very initial statement that this year's APEC will be remembered as a success because it was a there was a very important successful bilateral meeting, which is the U.S.-China meeting, which was not a given. And I'm hoping that that stability that it provides uh, to in bi not just in bilateral yeah. relations will also help stabilize and help prosperity, growth, and innovation in the larger Asia-Pacific region. I think that's that could be the most important takeaway. And I don't know if you had a chance to hear Dan Williams' very excellent setup to our interview, but in it, he said that uh, during some of his, of his speeches, especially to business leaders, President Xi received a number of standing ovations, and we had a chance to talk about this. I'll, I'll break the fourth wall here and say we had a chance to chat the last couple of days, and really the hottest ticket in San Francisco was trying to get into that business dinner where President Xi delivered that very important speech. Why so many U.S. businesses, Apple, uh, Microsoft, want to be there? Well, the reason they want to be there is because China is making this, 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 this great transition. We've talked about it also previously in being this high growth economy to becoming a high standards economy and making that transition to becoming a more consumption centered society. China is today, it's, I mean, it's $18 trillion, that's a huge amount. China could be $50 trillion, I mean, before 2050 is ar right. ar ar around. I mean, that's a huge amount of money, a huge amount of domestic demand in China, and a lot of goods to be sold to very intelligent and sophisticated consumers. And China is a world leader in a lot of this innovation. And if you are going to be a world champion at innovation, I'm talking a company, you need to have a China strategy. And that's why you need to compete with the best. The Chinese want to compete with the best in America, mm -hmm. so not be decoupled from that because it's only competition which breeds uh, better talent, better innovation. And at the same, in the same regards, you know, the Teslas of the world, they not want to be, they need to be in China Absolutely. because China is the most competitive EV market. And if you win that in that EV market, you're going to win across the world in terms of EV sales. So that's part of the reason I think uh, uh, corporations are very focused and gung ho on China, but that also requires important reforms in the next two, three years in China. And I'm hopeful that that will come through now that that China is kind of getting out of that yes. post-COVID economic malaise, and we are seeing private fixed asset investment really begin to turn around in China, and I hope that momentum carries going forward. Sir, so, I think one indication of that, that is the next APEC meeting is in Peru, and they're already talking about that, and China's important seat at the table there with all its investment in Latin America. Sir, Guta, thank you so much.